I'm Dr. Iftikhar Klu, a consultant in the Department of Cardiovascular Disease and a professor of medicine in the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. And I'm Dr. Maya Safarova, an associate professor of medicine and a postdoctoral fellow in cardiovascular biomarker research lab, also here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And today we're delighted to discuss our uh, review article, uh, our treatment approach to a patient with familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH, that has been published in Mayo Clinic proceedings. We believe it's important and timely given the relatively high prevalence of uh, familiar hypercholesterolemia, or FH as we would refer to it uh, subsequently. FH is a relatively common Mendelian genetic disorder. Uh, we believe the prevalence uh, varies from uh, one, to, uh, 1 in 250 to 1 in 500, and it may actually be even more common in certain ethnic groups uh, around the world. Furthermore, uh, the awareness among cardiologists uh, in the United States doesn't seem to be very high for this condition. And in one study, less than a third of cardiologists were uh, actually uh, able or were thought they would be comfortable with making a diagnosis of FH. Also, registry data suggests that uh, patients with FH may not always be um, adequately treated. In fact, up to 25% of patients with FH do not have a target LDL level, which is uh, less than 100 milligrams per DL. Uh, we should also say, uh, mention here that severe hypercholesterolemia, which is an LDL level of greater than 190 milligrams per DL, is quite prevalent. In a study we did here, individuals uh, from the employee and community health uh, cohort uh, had a prevalence of about 5% for severe hypercholesterolemia, which is much, much more prevalent than familiar hypercholesterolemia, but nonetheless it does illustrate the burden of this condition. FH is an autosomal co-dominant genetic disorder, and there are three well-described genes that are harboring variants causing FH. Essentially, uh, pathogenic mutations lead to impaired function of LDL receptor, and as a result, there is reduced clearance of uh, cholesterol particles from the bloodstream. Uh, LDL receptor is encoded by the LDLR gene, and in the general population, more than 90% of cases uh, of a phage will have mutations in LDLR. There's also APOB, which uh, encodes apolipoprotein B, a binding domain for LDL particle. About 5% of FH cases will have uh, pathogenic variants in APOB. Finally, there's uh, PCSK9, uh, gain of function mutations in which are uh, known to increase to accelerate LDLR uh, receptor degradation and um, therefore they are reducing recycling of LDL receptor to the hepatocyte surface. Depending on the type of the mutation at each allele and uh, the number of affected genes, we are um, classifying a phage, identifying a phage as homozygous form or heterozygous form, uh, including compound or double uh, heterozygous FH. The cardinal manifestation of FH, as you can imagine, is a high LDL cholesterol level. There are age and sex-specific cutoffs for LDL levels, but typically one should suspect FH if the LDL level is greater than 190 milligrams per DL. Other factors that should uh, hint towards or point towards the presence of FH is a personal history in that patient of atherosclerotic vascular disease, or a family history of premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or high cholesterol levels. On physical exam, one should look for arcus senilis in the cornea, and also tendon xanthomatas that are often present in the Achilles tendon or in the extensor tendon of the arms. One may also look for signs of atherosclerosis, for example, in the carotid arteries manifesting as a carotid brui, or in the limbs manifesting as diminished pulses. We should look for signs or, or symptoms, or signs of uh, aortic stenosis, uh, such as an outflow murmur uh, on cardiac auscultation, patients with FH are prone to have aortic stenosis, particularly if they have high lipoprotein A levels. Well, um, I would add here that we are armed with two validated sets of clinical criteria, um, such as British Simon Broom Registry Criteria and Dutch uh, Lipid Clinic Network Criteria, which basically are encompassing all those hallmarks that you were just outlining. And um, what it helps us to do is to ascertain a phage as definite, probable, possible, or unlikely. 
Um, however, um, I want to briefly mention several pitfalls here. Um, first, these criteria are not applicable to the pediatric population, and um, what happens is that using this criteria, one can miss mild FH form. And this probably stems from the fact that there is an overlap in um, cholesterol levels in those who are mutation carriers and those are who are mutation negative. So uh, treatment of patients with FH is really centered on statins. We can uh, use as adjuncts uh, drugs like, uh, like azitamide or resins or even niacin. If one is still not at target LDL, which is typically a 50% reduction in, from baseline, or an LDL level of less than 100 milligrams per DL or less than 70 milligrams per DL, depending on whether or not the patient has atherosclerotic vascular disease. Fortunately, we have a new category of drugs that has now become available since last year when FDA approved two new um, PCSK9 inhibitors. And these are quite potent. They can lower LDL additionally by about 60%. For homozygous forms, as you can imagine, treatment is more challenging. And the same drugs that I just alluded to for heterozygous forms can be used. In addition, there are two drugs that have been also approved by the FDA for use in homozygous FH. And that is mypomersin and lomotibide. And these are drugs that act on the liver to reduce uh, VLDL production and can also lower LDL cholesterol. Finally, there's another set of uh, modalities that are not um, drugs. Uh, that can be used, and perhaps you can elaborate on those modalities that can be used. Over the past 30 years, uh, lipoprotein apheresis um, has been extensively used in patients with FH. Uh, currently, it, it is reserved for individuals with homozygous FH or severe heterozygous FH who are not tolerating those treatments. Um, it also could be used in uh, children uh, as early as two or three years. Um, surgery, uh, such as uh, liver transplantation or partial ileal bypass, um, trends are suggesting that the rates of um, using those are really declining across the globe. Probably because of the emergence of more potent medications. Absolutely. Yeah. We have outlined in our review article several uh, approaches to screening uh, for FH. Uh, I should just mention here that uh, for um, the ACC AHA guideline, there's a clear recommendation for family-based screening if uh, one of the members has an LDL cholesterol of greater than 190 milligrams per DL. Now, how should screening be done? It, you know, there are two approaches. One is to use genotype-based screening, and the other is to use just lipid levels. Genetic testing is really key in uh, making an FH diagnosis, and um, it's been shown that genotype-based uh, cascade screening is uh, more cost-effective than LDL-based screening in the countries where, where healthcare system is centralized. And uh, when genetic testing is performed in um, uh, family members extending that to second and third degree relatives, it is actually very useful to assess penetrance and identify more um, affected individuals. Prior to testing, uh, genetic counseling is helpful to um, solve those sometimes sensitive family and ethical issues. There's really a need for automated detection using the electronic health record, and this is something we are interested in. We are working on developing phenotyping algorithms that we can rapidly detect these patients so that they can be treated and we can prevent adverse outcomes. Another uh, EHR-based modality that we do need to develop is clinical decision support to help patients, to rather to help providers manage patients and their families with FH. Uh, a second emerging area that needs a fair bit of work is to uh, what ascertain or assign pathogenicity to variants, genetic variants in LDL or other genes in, implicated in FH uh, so that we can categorize them as being pathogenic versus being benign. Thank you for watching and we hope that you will find this article useful. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. 
You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about health care at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.